Welcome to tonight's live stream of painting Caladasia miniatures. I'm Jason, the creator of the Caladasia universe. And today, after a nice little break last week of doing a speed painting of this guy right here, one of the Surakari Dracos, the new miniature that I released a few months ago. Late last year or something like that? Yeah. I'm going to dive back into a nice, slow, very detailed paint job. And this time, I'm going to return to the first of the new miniatures I've released which was this guy here, the Irigul Hammerhead miniature. So this was like something from, you know, months ago, oh, almost a year ago that I actually released this miniature. This is the first refresh of any of the Kaladashi miniatures. So I'm gonna do a nice, really good paint job with that because the original one that I painted up, I went a little bit over joyous crazy with the wash and it kind of doesn't look all that great so I want to get a really nice very well painted Aragul hammerhead and in the process tonight I do want to have some time to talk about some things I think the last few paint tutorials I've done I've just gone some so fast through them that I really haven't talked about a lot of random topics like I like to do so I'm gonna dive in tonight and talk about game balance and how you approach that from designing a game with balance and some of the challenges and basically the impossible task that's ahead of you because it's not only impossible to mathematically do it because of all sorts of factors I'll explain later, you also run into serious limitations about how the human brain processes probability and understands and comprehends, pro comprehends probability. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start tonight's painting process of the live stream here. Let me swap over to my other camera. Hmm. There's nothing on that camera screen, is there? Why is there nothing on that camera screen? Let me hit that button. Nope. Um, well, that's, that's me. Uh, hit that button a little bit. I don't know what to tell you. Um, this is embarrassing. I apparently didn't test out my camera setup before I start the live stream. Um, hit some buttons here. Oh, that's why. You know what happened? I'm an idiot. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. See, the thing was, is I was shooting the uh, end phase video for Albion 8, which will hopefully be out next week. You guys can figure out what actually happened to that poor planet. And I moved my camera that I used to shoot the close-up shots of my painting things. And I didn't re-plug in the HDMI cable. Let me see if that works. There we go. Now we've got a live stream video. Awesome. Excellent. Sorry about that, guys. That is what happens when I don't properly test my equipment before the show begins. But I just did that now. So, all right. Let's actually begin painting here. Um, the base color for an Aragul warship has pretty much became desert yellow from the Army Painters War Paint series. And as usual, this type of paint is one that is, it's a very, very thick paint. You really want to water it down, otherwise you will lose detail. So that's why I'm working over here. I've got my wet palette. That lets me thin down paints and keep mixtures together for you know long periods of time. I actually built a more permanent one that I seal in with a sponge attached via a zip tie to the lid so it can help even keep the paints wet even longer for days on end. I bet some of these paints here are probably, yeah, they're still, some of these paints here are still wet from like, you know, a week ago last time I was doing painting. So, oh boy, that could have ended very, very badly. I knocked over my little backdrop that I never use anymore. <laughs> I have this white uh, foam core backdrop that I had set up for when I was shooting some of the other miniatures. When I get back, when I get to the bigger miniature, I zoom out a little bit, and I had this set up so that it, you know just be a white background. And I proceeded to almost knock it off the table because it's too big for the table. But regardless, all right, let's start here. I'm going to definitely apply a number of thin coats of this desert yellow to the areas of the Aragul warship that are going to be this kind of desert yellow color, which is pretty much anything that's not raised up. All these raised sections all have the brown oak brown color that I'll use later. But I am just going to go through here and just very carefully take this watered down paint and just start applying color. 
All right, now let's let's talk game balance. And I'm going to be at this for a while. This is going to be you know a number of thin down layers and all that fun stuff. Game balance when designing a game is effectively an impossible tactic or uh, an impossible goal. I'll be honest with you. And I'll, here's here is why. So first of all, we should probably mention, you know, when people generally talk game balance they're generally talking about list building you know is a unit worth its points yes or no is a unit worth over costed under costed you know all that kind of fun stuff that's generally what people are talking about because the balancing factor in most miniature games is going to be whatever the system is for building the list or building the scenario because not every game uses a point system there's been some rather interesting things over the years uh, I mean effectively they come down to point systems but they may not you know necessarily right out of the bat or just very obviously be something where you know a unit cost 100 points or 200 points or 50 points or 5 points whatever it may be but inevitably, there's some, usually, I mean, you know, Age of Sigmar was kind of an oddball example for a while there, and GW took a lot of flack for it, but there's usually some sort of system to balance, you know, one unit choice compared to another. All right, so why is it really impossible to get proper unit balance in a game? So you got to look at the types of value a unit provides to an army. So I can an example here for Legends of Caladasia. The value that you get for a unit depends on the unit's maneuverability. The more maneuverable a warship is, you know, that's generally more valuable. The more resilient a warship is, the more value valuable it is. Now, you know, of course, in 2nd edition Legends of Caladasia, all warships have the same top speed because, you know, it's space and that's how space should work. So that's not something that is factored into the points value of any of the units because that's something that is just fixed across all the units in the game. And, of course, you have your, um, in addition to resilient value in 2nd edition Caladasia, not only are you talking about the critical value that, you know, you have to roll to try to inflict critical hits on a ship, but also the special ability, the special cards like the reinforced structural integrity card or engine shielding, which allow the unit to mitigate um, critical hits when they do occur. So there's different types of resilience in 2nd edition Legends of Caladasia and other games have similar things to where, you know, resilience is not just necessarily hit points, it, it's part of it. Of course, once again, in Caladasia, resilience is part of hit points. The larger ships have more, uh, more, you know, haul points that they can take where they're destroyed, but at the same time, they're almost just as vulnerable to critical hits as little guys. So that's an interesting little balancing thing I've got going on in the 2nd edition of Caladasia. But, and then finally, in terms of providing additional value to your fleet, you have your firepower. That's your main value a warship provides. How many guns does it have? What range do those guns have? What kinds of power values? Increasing chances of critical hits. So there's a lot of value, primarily in Legends of Caladasia ships, because it's a game of space combat that comes in with the weapons that a particular warship carries. There's a huge. That's a huge part of its value. And if that's all the value was provided by a ship, were positive values that were unique depending purely on that ship, it would be, you could argue, it could be fairly easy to balance a game out. Because, you know, you could figure out, okay, a fire cannon over the course of a game is going to do this many critical hits, probably approximately. And then based on that, you know, you, you effectively would assign that fire cannon a certain point value and then you could you know multiply it by six if there's six of them on a frigate and then you know the frigate would have a multiplier based on how many hull points it has and then another multiplier based on its resilience value you know whether you've got a hull critical value of four versus critical value of five and so on 
then toss in javelin missiles, same basic thought process. So it, if that's all that a game was, list building could be done, it could be balanced fairly easy. But the reality is, that's not all units provide. There are multiplication factors. You see this, this is kind of some, a trend that you're seeing a lot in many modern miniatures games. Oh uh, boy. I don't know, I mean, I, I think it, you could, I don't know where it originally started, what it started originally, of course, it very famously, this is, this is how most collectible card games work. Magic the Gathering is a great example of this. But then again, you know, it's a collectible card game. But the idea, you know, when you start talking about multiplication factors, is that any given object, whether it's a card, you know, warship, missile, whatever, somehow improves on the value of neighboring units. Now these kind of mathematical things are very difficult to factor in to ba balance equations because they depend on they, they're, the benefit of them really depends on how much stuff is around the unit. If something, for example, like say give, in theory gives everybody the ability around them the ability to reroll attack dice, and in some ways Kaladasia has this with sensor points, but then again that's not really you know redundant or you know it's not really um, it's not really applicable to be honest with you. But so let's say a some kind of unit gives everybody around them the ability to reroll attack dice. Well, the value that you get for that particular special ability depends on how many people that are around them. Assume there's no limit on the ability. So if you have a next to one ship, it's not as giving you as much value as if you were to have it next to five ships. And at that point, because of the fact that there's a multiplication factor going on there, it's really impossible to factor that into the cost of to correctly balance that into the cost of a unit right because the value of that unit was really going to depend on exactly how many th you things are around it and you don't really know that and it's impossible to know that value when you are designing, when you sorry, when you're calculating the balance of all the units in the game, you really cannot even begin to calculate that because it depends so heavily on how the game is played out. So when you have units like that, there really aren't any of those in Caladasia, and I'll explain why in a little bit here. But you don't really know. Um, you, there's no way for you to apply a mathematical equation that's going to make a unit like that balanced. What you, what you would have to do in that case is you would have to apply a limit. Say, you know, three units around this guy get this said benefit. And if you do take that approach, then indeed you could kind of start to begin to figure out how much this unit is worth because then you could factor that, hit the, that math around the fact that there could be at most three units. And if you know a player has less than three units around it, well, that's their fault, and they're losing out on the value of the unit. But if you don't have a limit like that, there really is no way to fit, to accurately calculate just how valuable that kind of unit would be to a fleet. Now, Legends of Caladasia doesn't have anything like that, uh, at least not yet. And you're probably not going to see a whole lot like that. I won't say you'll never see anything like that. I'm sure I'll accidentally do something like, hey, this is kind of like it. And someone will yell at me five years from now, referencing this video that they watched. You promised you would never do that. But, you know, um, the reason why I don't do that is not only because it, like I said, it's not, it makes it significantly harder to, math to, check, to mathematically calculate balance, but it starts shifting the game's tactics very much towards list building. And my goal is to not create games where the tactics are all about list building. A lot of miniature games are moving in that direction. And honestly, oops, that's not good. I think I just got paint on the carpet, but that's right. I've, I've spilled so much awful stuff in this poor carpet. <laughs> anyway, there are actually, I think there are a lot of games kind of moving in that direction of 
There's a lot of emphasis on list building, and I honestly don't like that. So that's why it's a kind of a design style. You're probably not going to see much of Caladasia. I much for much more enjoy games where winning and losing depends on how well you use your guys in the tabletop, and not not a game where it's a three-hour game of paper, rock, scissors. Because paper, rock, scissors is fun because it's 30 seconds. Magic the Gathering can be fun, as long as people aren't violently yelling at each other. <laughs> I played Magic the Gathering convention a while ago. It got <laughs> things got a little heated in that in that thing. But Magic the Gathering can be fun, even though that's like like what Magic the Gathering is. Once again, it's a 10 to 15 minute game if you're playing as you know a standard game. So if you have a situation where it's basically paper, rock, scissors, then it's over in 10 minutes, and it was kind of fun. But when you have that on a three hour time scale where you kind of can know from the beginning that you can't really hurt your opponent, I mean, you could try, you know, and sometimes ideally if you're playing in a tournament situation, the missions are designed such to limit that kind of impact. You know, it's, that's not really a fun gaming experience. In the end, as a game developer, you know, I say it every time, your goal is simply to create a fun experience and nothing more. Obviously, your definition of what fun is can vary, but I can assure you when people are showing up to a game and they're losing because the fact that the opponent is so much better at list building than they are, most people won't find that fun. And, of course, I probably... I then, you know, it's, I just realized I could contradict myself. Because <laughs> on one hand, I say, well, most people won't find that fun. And yet, on the other hand, it's obvious that a lot of game companies out there are moving in that direction from a design perspective. Which seems to suggest that the market is saying that it is fun. That's my contradiction. Anyway. So... I, I think I got off on a random tangent because, you know, I kind of do that in this show. I just ramble. But, yes, so let's get back to talking about game balance. Because in addition to not only providing value to your units, units can also reduce the value of enemy units. And this is, once again, just like how there's a multiplier, a multiplier factor to it. Um, this is something that's impossible to really predict. And let me show you an example. I gotta let the paint, the layer of paint on this guy dry a little bit. I'm just layering lots of more layers of thin paint on top of thin paint. If you don't let the layers of thin paint dry between each of your layers, what tends to happen is you're just pushing around paint and you're not really adding an extra layer of paint on there. So let me just give that a few minutes here to dry. And I can talk about this example. Well, I am... So I'll talk about this example a little bit while I'm letting that dry. And this is a good time to do a little bit of a shameless self-promotion. A note here, keladagia.com forward slash live. You can head over there and find links in our online store to purchase the miniature you're seeing here. Let me paint up. This is the Aragul Hammerhead Frigate. Uh, $10, I think. <laughs> I think it's $10. If not, it's somewhere like $10, $11, somewhere in that range. But it comes with the pewter miniature you see here, as well as the acrylic flight stand that you need to get it all assembled. And I believe, yes, it does. It, all, you can, it can also be built as this guy here, the Aragul Mackerel with 3D printed guns. All right. Now, while I'm letting this paint dry here, let me talk about the little example I was going to say. So here was the Draco I painted up last week. And then here... Is the alternative version of Surakari Frigga, this guy, this is the Delphinus. In game terms, currently the Draco is 12 points, the Delphinus is 8 points. Now this is where I'm talking about how when game balance comes into it, it's tough to figure out how a unit negatively impacts an enemy fleet. The difference between these two ships is that the Draco over here carries two additional guns, and if you do the math, you can probably figure out that's 8, eight attacks per game, that means the Draco is probably going to do four additional critical hits, because usually you're hunting light targets with the Draco. Four, three to four additional critical hits per game compared to the Delphinus. That's a lot of extra damage. It's about a 50% extra damage of a Aragul or, or Surakari frigate. Um, 
so that, that why that's one of the reasons why this ship over here is worth less points because it, does, it can do significantly less damage during the game. But the problem is. The Delphinus' main ability here is this guy has got on top of it, the Phalanx Anti-Missile Battery. The Anti-Missile Battery, as the name suggests, is fantastic at shooting down missiles carried by ships like the Aragol Hammerhead, this is that we're painting up here today, and of course the guy that I worked on for a whole bunch of painting sessions recently, the Aragol Pale Fox, sorry, Aragol Main Wolf Seeking Missile Destroyer, the Pale Fox and Heavy Gun version of this guy. Now, because the, by the Delphinus having a better chance of shooting down incoming missiles from the Aragul or potentially a Surakari or Kolithgard fleet if you're playing the other factions out there, the destruction of those missiles effectively reduces the overall value of the enemy fleet. Now, I can kind of factor that in a little bit into the game because the fact is the mathematically the Delphinus will probably shoot down two missiles per turn that is alive. So you can kind of factor that a little bit into balance, thinking, okay, it's going to kind of neutralize one hammerhead frigate per turn, assuming that its guns are able to do so. Because it also, just by the fear, by the simple fact that it's on the board, it's going to change how the Aragul player fires their missiles at which target. Because ideally, you don't want the missiles going anywhere near this thing, because this thing can chew them up, potentially destroying four a turn if it gets really, really lucky. And that's so... But then, of course, if the Aragul doesn't bring any missile units, you can, second edition right now, you could do that by running purely with Pale Fox Destroyers and this guy here, the Aragul Mackerel, which is the other variation of the frigate that you're seeing me assemble and paint today. If a Aragul fleet shows up with that, or if a Koeth Guard fleet shows up with just Ascotas and Argyles and Arcadias and things like that, there are no missiles for the Delphinus to shoot down. So now you got a situation where the Surakari fleet has effectively paid for something, expecting something to show up, but it didn't show up, and it's not really their fault. It's not a tactical flaw on their end, the fact that the opponent didn't bring a certain unit to the tabletop, and you can't actually factor the, the unknown, which is what is the enemy's army, into balancing points-wise of your own units. So that's one of the main reasons, like, when you get in the situations where units are multipliers, where they enhance the, your own units, or in this case, subtractors, where they reduce the value of enemy units that may or may not be in the battlefield, you really can't ever properly, m properly balance that just because there's so many unknowns that you can't, there's no way to mathematically represent those set unknowns. But it's looking like the first layer of thin paint here on the Aragul hammerhead is starting to dry. So let me swap back over to my work camera and we will get back to painting up this guy. Just give it, what I'm gonna start doing now is applying a few highlights and that's where I'm going to take some linen white. This is from the Reaper Master series, but it's really just an off-white color. It doesn't matter exactly what color it is that guy in there make him look cool and menacing over in the corner because he can shoot down these guys two missiles and I'm gonna mix a little bit of that in with a desert yellow to get a slightly just a slightly brighter color not by much just a slightly brighter color because I'm just trying to get a little bit of color variation across this ship oh and I should mention since I didn't really mention earlier for all this painting on this guy, since it's all detail work, I'm going to be using my uh, Games Workshop Citadel's Artificial Layer Extra Small Brush. Alright, so now I've got the white, or I mixed a little bit of the linen white in here. And I'm just applying that, also it's still a very thin layer, to a lot of the edges and edges of the thing, some of the centers. I'm just trying to get a little bit of color variation going on here across this Aragul frigate. So you can see there's there's a lot of challenges when it comes to even trying to achieve mathematical balance and that's why honestly it, it probably will never happen if you're making a game and 
and that's why, I mean, you should focus a little bit on it. Stuff that's really egregiously broken isn't fun to play against. But, you know, it comes back down to the old thing. Your end goal is let's make a fun game. If you make a fun game, people are going to play it. People are going to want to play it. Because, you know, you could. It's, it's the old adage with Warhammer 40,000. There is no balance, but the thing is people enjoy playing the game and that's what it comes down to it's they're really and you know so, and the approaches that the games workshop historically has taken for some of their um you know new additions to the game it's it's literally impossible for them to ever even achieve a proper mathematical balance you can't just wholesale change rules and special abilities and without changing the point value of units that are affected by those said special abilities and rules. It just doesn't it just doesn't work. It's gonna inevitably make some units overpowered for their point cost and it's gonna negatively impact other units. But in the end, they've succeeded in creating a game that people really enjoy playing and even though it can be very frustrating to play 40k imagine a tournament environment i've never tried to do that i really have no desire to try to do that it's you know people still buy it and they've been the games workshop has been incredibly successful at creating a game now there's another huge problem when it comes to even possibly achieving balance and it has to do a lot with human psychology humans are very very poor at judging probability and here's why this is a problem and not just in the weather industry <laughs> someone out there found that funny I'm sure I'm sure um, <laughs> if you have anything to do with meteorology at all you probably found that funny no but humans just are very very poor at judging probability we're and it's not that we're like stupid or crazy or weird. It's that our brains are just very poor adjusting to probability. That's all it really comes down to. So why is that? How does that affect balance? Well, it doesn't affect balance. It affects the perception of balance, which for some people, when it comes to having a fun gaming experience, is just as damaging as uh, having a game that truly is way out of balance. Because, you know, you can achieve, I should say, you can achieve some balance. You just can't ever achieve perfect mathematical balance. Because um, if you really think about it, if you want to try and achieve balance, because, you know, you should at least make an effort for it when you're trying to develop a miniatures game. I mean, I, I've tried my best with 2nd Edition Caladagia to to try and get a, a fair amount of balance. Part of the reason why there's not a whole lot of warships out yet is I want to start small and add on as things go on and make sure I got the initial stuff balanced out pretty good. And then start bringing in some of the rest of the warships first edition and of course adding some new, in, new ones in here and there. Um, but if you really want to try to go for balance, it just takes a lot of games. I, you know, I there's not really a hard, fast rule as to how many games it takes. It really depends on the sheer amount of possibilities you have to test. And frankly, when you get to games like Warhammer, where you can equip guys a million different ways, you're never ever going to be able to play enough games in your lifetime to ever figure out if something is truly balanced. Combinations are the enemy of balance, which, unfortunately, combinations are what people like for all sorts of different things. But you know, that's a good. I, I should. That's a really good point that I didn't make when I was talking about balancing games. There is that combinations really are the enemy of balance. The more combinations you have, the harder and harder it would be to ever achieve anything that resembles actual mathematical balance. So. The problem though is if you really want to understand whether a game is balanced or not, you really got to play it a crap ton of times, which as a developer you should be doing. But the thing is, for your random people who are going to be playing the game, possibly trying out for the first time, 
and even playing it a few times in like a tournament setting if possible, the people who are doing that simply lack the experience to really judge if a game is balanced or not. It's and it's, like I said, it's not because they're insulting, you know, not because they're stupid or something weird like that. It's because the amount of information you need to mathematically to judge if a game is mathematically or balanced or not is simply not available to somebody who's only played a, the game a handful of times. Um, with that being said, once it comes down to once again, humans are not very good at judging probability. They have no problem diving in and trying to make assessments on whether a game is balanced or not based on this limited amount of information. And if you've got some really weird situation that even though it should occur one every hundred games, if it comes up within the first two or three games of somebody playing, especially if it's a very destructive thing, like I've known there's been tabletop space combat games before where, you know, a critical hit, albeit incredibly rare, can potentially destroy a ship in the first roll. I absolutely despise those kind of mechanics. Some people enjoy them, some people don't. I personally don't, and I, you'll never see that in Caladagia, mainly because it's ridiculously impossible to try to balance, and frankly, it's not a lot of fun if your big battleship gets blown up in the first volley because some luck guy got a lucky roll that triggered off 17 ammo explosions, and kaboom. Um, the problem is, if something like that does happen, you know, even if it's one out of every hundred games, if it happens to a person in their second game, they're gonna naturally tend to find that your game is fundamentally flawed and broken, even though it's functioning exactly as you intended. <laughs> See the wonderful, wonderful world you're walking into? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start. Let's see, how's these, how's the paint drying up here? I don't, of course, I don't really have a good answer for you about that because that's a human psychology question and that's not what I do, but it's just something as a game developer to obviously be aware of the fact that people really don't understand probability and that's going to, that's going to reflect how someone views your game and how much fun they have playing your game and just be aware of it and factor it into your game design, you know, th decide ahead of time, does it matter to you or not? That's really what it comes down to. And that's a question that you, as a game designer, have to answer. I can't answer that for you, no one can. If someone hates that, well then they're not gonna buy your game, but that may, you just have to make that decision that, oh well, I, you know, they're not gonna buy my game, oh well, I have to live with it, right? <laughs> So a lot of this stuff I'm talking about here is really, like I said, since it's kind of impossible to achieve mathematical balance. It's about understanding that these things can happen and just factoring that into how you approach your tabletop game design and how you try to, to achieve something that kind of looks like mathematical balance. All right, I need to start applying some even more highlights here. But of course, I want to be very careful and apply highlights only a little bit at a time. And this is where that technique I used a lot on the main wolf is gonna come in, where you apply only small amounts of paint at a time and let the brush run out of paint. And then once the brush runs out of paint, it'll start applying the highlight, it'll kind of start spreading out the highlights a little bit. So what I'm gonna work on here Let's see if I can put it at a good angle for you. You probably can't see too well, but there are, let's see, yep, yeah, yeah, okay, so that one's the, so there's about a few raised armor panels right here, my brushes, and then there's a few more right here. These are great examples as to where you can use some highlighting to catch the edges and make the edges stand out a little bit. So I'm going to take some of the linen white, mix it in with the uh, desert yellow to get a really bright peach color. I'm gonna wipe most of the paint off my brush and I'm gonna go back in and just get a tiny amount of paint on the tip of my brush. Uh, let's see here, uh, you probably no, but can't really see it very well, but trust me, it's a very small amount of paint on the tip of the brush. And you just wanna paint a little bit on the edges and then you can kinda wipe it off your brush a little bit so you get all the rest of the paint off and then keep painting some more. And what that's gonna do is since your paint has no more 
pigment on it to apply to the miniature, it's going to spread out what's already there. And it's a way of getting very smooth, very smooth highlights on to these edges of the miniature. Because what you want to do is avoid obvious highlights. And it's, it's tricky to do. You know, I've shown off my, the Pale Fox miniature I had which had very obvious highlights to it and I mean you know it happens it just doesn't look as good as if you can try to very carefully get smooth transitions of color and it's not hard you know it's it, it is fiddling it's kind of challenging but with some practice you can do it and when you get it right it looks really cool because it really looks like there's some actual just natural variations of color and it doesn't look like you're obviously trying to do edge highlighting It's definitely an effect, honestly, it looks really good like on organic stuff because, you know, organic things tend to have a variety of colors. Spacecraft, not necessarily. Spacecraft could have flat colors if you want him to. But, you know, it looks a lot better if you don't. Even this little guy here that I painted up in an hour, I used some washes and a little bit, a very small amount of dry brush and get a, some variation in color. So we're going to keep working over here. Same thing on this side. The Aragul frigate is more or less symmetrical. I mean, I guess there could be some weird damage to the miniature. It happens. Um, but once again, you've got a little two, little raised step thing going on here. And I'm going to be applying very small amounts of that, of the brighter paint on the edges. And then as the paint runs out, slowly keep painting it backwards to get an, a relatively smooth color transition. And then I can go back in with a little bit of darker color and apply that on the back of those things and kind of paint backwards to blend the paint in even more. So that way if you got a little too much bright paint on by painting some dark color in the back and brushing forward then you can kind of blend in the bright with the original darker color and get a you know re repair a little bit of the damage you do because you added you know too much bright paint. The thing to remember about that is every time you add paint to a miniature you are effectively going to one reduce uh, detail because the, the paint's going to fill in little tiny details and you're going to lose detail that way but also as you add additional layers of paint it tends to be not quite as smooth and it's not as photogenic and you'll end up with something like this this is the guy I'm, I'm replacing right now I went really overboard with the wash you can see there and you know if you I tended to glob on a lot of the brown paint and it didn't stick very well around areas so it, it, you lose a, by adding lots of layers of paint you not only lose detail but it doesn't take pictures very well because you'll, you'll be able to zoom in you'll be, able to, you'll be able to see the different layers of paint and it just it yeah yeah <laughs> taking trying to paint miniatures for really good up close shots is very very challenging and that's why I've adapted some of these techniques where you use very small amounts of paint at a time because that's kind of what you have to do and that helps hide like anything like any layers of paints or even if you apply pigment pigment on too thick what happens is you can see, you can sometimes see the individual flakes of pigment. I ran into that problem with the main wolf here on all the gray sections. I'm not sure if my gray paint was just old, but it's a very uneven texture on these sections. And it even became even worse when I applied the various silver coatings to it because that really kind of acted like a dry brush and brought out a lot of the, the texture there. I've got a way to try that differently this time. I've I bought some of GW's fancy Lemain medium or something like that, which is basically the paint minus the pigment. And when it comes to the that Dawnstone gray color, I'm gonna mix that in, and I'm curious to see if that does anything differently. It could do absolutely nothing, and that that Lemain medium could more or less just be just overpriced, useless stuff. But I'll find out. <laughs> It could be really cool. I really have no idea what it's used for. 
but I figured I'd give it a shot and see if it solves the problem. But I'm keeping the same process here and I'm working on the guns. As I'm just, you can actually see, you, so you can see there there's a bright streak. That's the paint I just added. And then I can start using the brush without any paint on to then blend that bright streak into the areas around it. And it kind of helps create a nice highlighted area at the top of the gun, but it's not a very well defined area. It's much more diffuse which looks a lot nicer than having just a single bright streak up there. Doing the same thing to the rest of the guns. Then we got a lot more edges and things we're going to go ahead and add a lot of brighter details on. Of course, we have the javelin launchers up here. These are, these are the little boxy missile launchers at the top. Same process. Going to put a little bit of bright paint on the edge and just keep pulling back with the brush as it runs out of pigment. And that'll blend that bright color into the a little bit darker color layers below it. I already put a few layers of brighter color on the edges of the Jalen missile launcher. And we gotta do the same kind of thing for the top of the main gun turret there. Whoops, that's a little bit too much paint. Shoot. <laughs> Careful there, Jason. It's very easy to accidentally add a little bit too much paint, so I'm gonna have to fix that now. <laughs> but I, I was, you know, applying the bright colors of the paint here, and I got a little bit too much of the bright colors on. So I'm gonna do a reverse process like I was doing down there earlier. Once again, you're gonna risk losing a little bit of detail and making it kind of a little more visible of your shading, sorry, you're visible of your color layers, but it's sometimes what you have to do to fix a mistake. And you know, mistakes happen. I'm still not a professional painter by any means with these guys. I'm just learning how to paint them as best as possible so they look cool on the website for you guys to buy them. Once again, I sell these miniatures and I want you guys to buy them. <laughs> How's that for obvious promotional? Probably doesn't work doing that, does it? I wish it was that simple. <sighs> Marketing is hard. Someday I'll have to do, talk about that. When I get it all figured out. I figured out a few pieces of it. I'm experimenting with others and it's just not easy to figure out marketing. It's just not, you know, I don't mind rambling about it. I'm an engineer. Oh, my degrees, my college degrees are all in engineering and here I am. Wanting to sell little metal miniatures to people. Hmm. Turns out those degrees are a whole lot of good, weren't they? <laughs> I probably should have... I honestly probably should have become a meteorologist. I had that choice. Um, but that's a whole other topic altogether. But I think it's the issue why, why I bring up the whole point about being an engineer. It's... Engineers, we don't really like marketing people. They're kind of our arch enemies in a lot of ways because engineering is really about, you know, rational, rational thought, trying to solve problems through thinking. And marketing, it really is about trying to convince people to buy a product with, in a lot of ways, as little thought as possible. Um, so marketing is, and that's why marketing is not one of my strong points. It's not really something my, I'm, my brain is conditioned to do, but it's something you really have to learn if you want to create your own anything, really. It's not just the tabletop game industry. Marketing is important to any kind of commercial product if you want to succeed. We'll put it this way. There's very valid reasons why celebrities can be paid millions upon millions of dollars to endorse some 
random silly product like deodorant, it really does matter to people. You know, whereas the engineer is kind of like, well, who cares that a famous basketball player is pitching this deodorant? That kind of thing really does drive sales. And that's where, you know, the engineering thinking and marketing thinking collide. And it's like, well, ugh. <laughs> I'll figure it out one of these days. I'm just rambling now. Someone's going to find this video like 10 years from now and all this. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm sure I'll hear about it then. But I'm still continuing the same process I've been doing for the last little bit here. Where any of the edges, I'm applying a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter amounts of, or yeah, a little bit brighter uh, mixes of the desert yellow paint. And then I'm working, working those brighter edges into the layers of color below to get a little bit of um, you know, color variation and kind of a very diffuse edge highlighting look. Because like I said, color variation makes things interesting. It makes it interesting for your eye. It really does. Then that's why it's worth spending the time to do this, but it's something that's not easy to do, especially for photogenic miniatures. It can, it's a lot easier if you just want to make something that looks good on the tabletop. But if you're trying to make something that looks good to a macro lens, it's quite a bit, quite a bit more challenging to that. Do it. Okay. That's looking pretty good. Um, I'm trying to decide. There's a few areas where I probably could add a little bit more color down here in these recesses. There's not a lot of color. I'm gonna apply a little bit more there. But most of the areas that are going to end up being this beige color is looking like, is they're looking pretty good. Whoops, I'm dropping my paintbrush again. I do that about once an episode. I think if I don't drop my paintbrush, something's not right. Of course, the fact that I drop my paintbrush so much makes it indicate something's wrong. But that's a whole other topic altogether. Hey. All right, I probably should put a little bit of more paint on the sides of the miniature here. And probably tonight I'll just finish up with this base coat of this desert yellow and next week, I should be here next week, I don't really go anywhere Thursday nights to be honest with you, <laughs> that's why I'm always here. Thursday nights are the boring nights of the week, there really is generally nothing going on. My night consists of coming home from work, rock climbing, picking up dinner, because it's the one night of the week I allow myself, well, okay, not the only one night of the week. It's the one night of the week I'm guaranteed to allow myself to eat out, and I pick up some takeout, and I come home here and I live stream to you guys. That's my Thursday night. <laughs> oh, boy. The joys. The joys of trying to run a small startup company selling tiny pewter, pewter spaceships to people. Oh, and resin spaceships, I sell those too. As you saw the last whole bunch of time. The, the joys of trying to sell tiny little miniature spaceships to people in your spare time. But, you know, I'll see. I had an idea for a new YouTube series today. I don't know if I'm ever going to make it. I really want to. It's a little bit more of a general audience mass market thing that I think would be fun. Um, but we'll see. I'm just, I'm kind of rambling right now, I'll be honest with you. Like, hey, I was rambling all episode, wasn't I? But we got about 10 minutes left. I've more or less talked about a lot of the issues with game balance. I don't really have a whole lot more to say on it at this moment. Maybe in the future. Of course, if you guys want to leave comments on the YouTube videos about something for me to talk about, or if you have any questions about some of the things I said today about game balance, feel free to leave notes there. But right now I'm just kind of filling in a little bit more color here on the bottom of the warship, just to give it a nice even coat of color. And I probably got about Let's see, was it 8.50? So maybe about 10 minutes left in the show tonight. And then next week, I think I'm going to pick up painting in some of the oak brown. Oak brown is 
the color from Army Painter that I use to paint all the raised armor sections. Or I might dive in. You know what I might do? I probably need to uh, start doing a little bit of wash work with um, some of these things. So we're going to be using the non-oil shade from GW Citadel Paint Line. And I'm going to use that to bring out some of the details. I, running into some of the recesses along you run along the sides of some of the raised areas and stuff like that to what do you want to how's the right way to say it stuff like that to um help your eye pick up the detail that's really what it's, that's one of your goals when painting miniatures is to think about that it's not just giving the miniature some color but it's you want to give the miniature color in such a way that's gonna help the human eye and the human brain pick out the detail. The detail in these guys is really small, naturally because they're, they're tiny, small spaceships. But a painting can be, can be used to make that detail more visible. And when you make that detail more visible, it makes the ship or the miniature you're looking at that much more interesting. And it just and it really to people it looks a lot cooler because you can see the little ridges and the cooling vents and all that stuff a lot easier if you paint it the right way to bring that detail out. And I forgot to mention that here tonight in southeastern Michigan is a high wind, well, it's a high wind advisory, not a high wind warning. That was a few weeks ago. Whew, that was an adventure. <laughs> it's a high wind advisory. So there's always a chance that my power will go out, which, you know, I've made the rest of the show at this point, so we're probably good. But it's always a slight possibility that I might lose power and I'll just randomly stop streaming. And if that happens, that's what happened. And yes, it was a high wind advisory and 35 degrees today, and I was out running in it. <laughs> My crazy runner. I think I mentioned that before. I'm kind of one of those really stupid crazy crazy runners to the point where it's stupid. That's me. Um, it turns out that running in a 35 degree weather with 40 mile an hour wind gusts is a really stupid thing to do, but it sounded cool and it's kind of fun in the process. I almost got frostbite, I'm sure, but you know. The, the key is when in those conditions you run in areas where you know you're going to have nice warm areas to go in and hide. And I did that. I took full advantage of nice warm areas to hide. So it was a lot of fun to go and run in that kind of that kind of horrible, horrible conditions. Especially in the summer when there's high wind advisories and things. Oh man, it's so much fun to go running in, that's in those conditions. It's great training. It's ex significantly hard to run into the wind and build up endurance that way. And when you're running... Um, crosswind to where you know you're running peril perpendicular to the direction of the wind what tends to happen is as your leg is up in mid stroke the wind blows it into the other leg it's it's really it's intense it's really intense to go running in high winds but yes I am a crazy crazy stupid runner I'm not gonna lie <laughs> I run all the crazy stupid races I don't do a lot of super distance ones but there's plenty of shorter ones that are crazy stupid There's there's uh, 5K courses around here that have close to 250 feet of elevation climb, which is stupid amounts of elevation climb for, for a 5K race. A lot of half marathons have like 400 feet, four to 500 feet of elevation climb, and of course they're you know four times as long as that 5K course, and I tend to run the 5K course twice in a row. I've even, there's a one hill around here that if you run a 5k up and down it, it is 600 feet of elevation. Is that right? Yeah, six. Yeah, because it's six laps up and down to a 5k up this hill because it's about a quarter mile up the hill and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 to 600 feet of elevation climb in a 5k course if you just run up and down this hill. That's intense running training there, my friend. My friends out there. So feel free to ask any questions about running training. <laughs> if you ever watch this later on YouTube, I'm like, hey, 
I got a weird eye question about running training. Feel free to ask away. But I think I'm just about done here with the base color of this desert yellow, yellowish color thing here. It's looking pretty good. The areas that are going to be yellow look like they're coated pretty well. Any of the areas you see that are not coated very well are going to end up being either gray and silver or oak brown. But I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing here. I'm getting fairly good consistent coloring. I don't see a lot of patchy colors. I don't see the brown primer very well. Which, by the way, the brown primer was from Army of Painters line. I think it's the oak brown, brown. I don't know if it's oak brown, but they have a brown primer color from the same line of paints as this stuff, and that's where it came from. I like, and it just I choose to use that on the Aragul miniatures because. It does more or less match the same hue that you're going to be working with. The yellows and the browns really go on top of it very well. Whereas black tends to, um, the black primer in the, with the Aragul miniatures, the this desert yellow becomes very difficult to paint over it because it's such a lighter color. And then white primer, I don't know, maybe I, I might have just got a bad can from GW or something, but the white primer I have from, that I got from GW is just garbage. But it may have just been a bad can. And it just flakes off and doesn't actually really stick to my miniatures. Or maybe there's just something funny about the pewter that I'm using that that, that the GW primer doesn't like. Because that can happen where certain brands of paints are really designed to work on certain types of miniatures. And they don't really... Um, what's, what's the thing I want to say? They don't really stick to other types of miniatures or other types of paints. So that could, it could just be that there's something funny about the pewter that I'm using, even though it's pretty standard lead-free pewter. I don't know, but like I said, it could have just been a bad can. You get you get you get kind of crummy paint products every now and then from every company, so it happens. The local GW store owner describes their um, uh, sitting over there. The liquid green stuff can give you some serious sass sometimes. It doesn't happen very often, apparently, but that's just, that's his um, euphemism for a defective bottle of liquid green stuff. <laughs> like, if it gives you any sass, just bring it back, and I will I'll replace it for you. <laughs> he said it doesn't happen very often, but it seems to be often enough to where he's got to warn anyone who buys it that it can happen to it. So who knows? The green stuff is pretty cool, though, I'm not going to lie. That's one of my more favorite paint products I have. Alright, put a little bit of bright white paint, or the bright, um... Whatever you call it. I mixed in a lot of linen white with a desert yellow to give some really bright edge highlights. And I put a little too much of it on there, so i got to kind of pull it back a little bit. And the one thing nice about using thin, really thin layers of paint, so if you do this where you kind of put too much of the bright color on, you can just use a very thin layer of the base color and just go back over it. And that just kind of dulls the brightness down a whole lot without just completely overwriting the little bit of bright color that you just added there. But I'm liking what I'm seeing right there. Let me swap back over to my other camera, and we can call this show done for tonight. So once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Kaladasha Universe. You can learn more about the Kaladasha Universe. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> I should not drink a whole bunch of pop before I do the show. Apparently, causing me to burp like crazy. Um, <laughs> But anyway, you can find more about the Caladagia universe over here at this little thing down here. This is caladagia.com forward slash live. And you can find links to buy not only the miniature I'm working on here tonight, but of course other guys like the main wolf and the Surakari Corona Destroyer, which I painted up earlier, very first of the year is what I did. The Surakari Corona was the first miniature I painted in 2017 here live on this live stream and I do this live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time which of course during Daylight Saving Time is it Daylight Saving Time? Yes, it's Daylight Saving Time. It's not Daylight Savings Time. There's no plural on savings. It drives some people crazy. I'm pretty sure it's Daylight, it's daylight Saving Time. Anyway, that's GMT minus four for all those who are outside the country of the United States or outside the Eastern time zone and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, once again, I'm going to call this whole live stream done. So thank you for watching. 
feel free to subscribe here on twitch.tv because not only do I paint up Caladagian miniatures, but I paint up and other random projects from time to time. And you can just follow me here on twitch.tv to get notifications about when I go live for that. It is a two-step process to get notifications about when people go live. So feel free to do that with my channel because later on in the summer, I'm going to be rebuilding this guy here, the Aragul Special Forces cosplay. And I'm going to try to actually make the vest go from being some weird chintzy plasticky thingy to kind of looking like a more modern military unif battle armor uniform. So it'll look, I hope it'll look pretty cool. But anyway, thank you for watching and have a good night.